is lecture outline 10, recording number 4, starting with page 13. Um, I've still got my calculator here, uh, however we haven't used it, and I don't think we will this entire lecture outline. Still got my periodic table handy, always useful. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, which is a theory that basically says uh, valence shell electron pairs, which are going to be bonding electron pairs, or sorry, uh, the um, in Lewis structures, repel or repulse each other, and the abbreviation is VSEPR, and that's typically pronounced VESPER, um, even though that's not exactly how it's spelled. Okay, so the main thing in this theory is that we're going to define this term called an electron group. And each electron group around an atom is in its lowest energy state when it is as far as possible from other electron groups. One electron group is a single bond. One electro electron group is a double bond. One electron group is also a triple bond. And one electron, electron group is a non-bonding or lone pair of electrons. A non-bonding or lone pair of electrons couple of examples to give you an idea about how these electron groups work. Let's look at the Lewis structure for water, H2O. We can see, uh, and so the, uh, the, the, we'll be doing electron groups around only central atoms because they're going to help us determine the shape around those atoms. And what we find is that for oxygen, there is a non-bonding or lone pair another non-bonding or lone pair, so that's two electron groups, three electron groups for this single bond, four electron groups around oxygen. On the other hand, if we look at C2H4, and again, we're gonna do electron groups around each central atom separately. This carbon has one single bond, a second single bond, and a double bond, so three electron groups. This carbon also has one, two, three electron groups as well. And what we'll do is we'll do electron groups and then use that to determine shape, as you'll see, for every single central atom. Every single atom surrounded by more than one uh, or two or more bonds or more two or more things. So we're going to use valence or Vesper theory. We're going to also use something called valence bond theory. Uh, and this, uh, the working definition of this is a covalent bond forms due to the overlap of one orbital from each of the two bonded atoms and We'll identify those orbitals and then draw them as well. Part of this will be that atomic orbitals hybridize or mathematically recombine into new orbitals to lower the energy of the molecule. And these hybridized orbitals are hypothesized to exist to explain the shapes of molecules. to explain the shapes of molecules. So, simply by considering uh, orbitals from before, S's, S orbitals, P orbitals, 
um, d orbitals, we will not be able to explain the shapes of molecules. So we uh, are hybridizing them to help explain it. And it is a real process, meaning it is mathematically, it can be done, although we won't get into the mathematics. We'll just uh, talk about the results. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, how these two theories combine to tell us about the shapes of molecules. Electron geometry, the shape of the electron groups around a central atom, it will depend on how many electron groups are around the central atom. For two electron groups, always the electron geometry is linear. The bond angle will be 180 degrees. And the hybridization will be sp. sp hybridization and a couple things I'll say about this as we go through these. Uh, first, these three things always go together. And second, the number of hybridized orbitals, so there's an S and a P orbital, that's two hybridized orbitals because there are two electron groups. Two electron groups, two hybridized orbitals. Coming up, three electron groups, three hybridized orbitals. Okay, so uh, uh, beryllium dihydride, this is a case where uh, we see beryllium, and I said you don't have to memorize this, but it turns out that beryllium only wants two bonds and a total of four valence electrons, so this is a good Lewis structure, even though it doesn't follow the octet rule. And um, I can see that there are uh, two electron groups around the central atom. The bond angle from H to beryllium to hydrogen is 180 degrees. And it will have sp hybridization. And let's talk a little bit about what that means. So uh, I'm going to do the electron configuration for the beryllium atom here. Beryllium atom four electrons, 1s2, ding, 2s2, that's it. And if we were to draw the uh, orbital energy diagram for this, we would have energy, we would have 1s, 2s, and we would put the electrons in, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the 2p exists, it just doesn't have any electrons in it. For now, we are going to draw the 2p and all three of the 2p orbitals. Now, the hybridization process will occur. A couple things as we hybridize. One is we will take one of the s's and one of the p's. All right, I'm gonna make these notes up here. And we know that because there are two electron groups and it tells us right here, sp hybridization. And it doesn't matter which p we take this time because they're all empty, but you'll see that you also want one electron for hybridized orbitals. So we want one electron per hybridized orbital. And that will be for bonding, as we'll see. You know, the story's not complete yet, but we're getting there. So we circle those two. Then when we move over to our beryllium atom hybridized, we'll draw the same arrow, the 1s doesn't change. 2s is now gone we now have the 2s and one of the 2p's as hybridized orbitals, and they will be at the average energy that they were when separate, so somewhere right in the middle here. All 
and then the two that are unhybridized still up there and next is if there are two electrons in your hybridized orbitals there must be two electrons still in them and now they're in different orbitals because these two orbitals have the same energy and similar to things we've done before put one electron on each of them before you pair them okay that is the finished picture of the beryllium atom hybridized these two sp orbitals are going to be the bonding orbitals now let's go on all right so how do we picture hybridization from beryllium dihydride so we have the 2s and the 2pz orbital could be any of them and these two are going to make uh, two orbitals so um, uh, in fact, you're going to pair up with the 2s and the 2pz to make sp hybridized orbitals. And those two will make... Um, uh, so p orbitals have different phases. And we don't want to get too much into this, but what happens is where they have the same phase, they're going to add. So you can see the portion getting bigger, just like waves. And these are probabilities electrons and where there are opposite in phase we'll have subtraction also called destructive interference and we end up with this tiny part over here so here's the second one so or we can think of this as constructive and destructive interference you end up with your two sp hybridized orbitals that are in exactly opposite directions they have these interesting shapes, but we will draw them more simply like this. Um, and when I say draw the shape of beryllium chloride now, we were working on beryllium hydride before. Um, actually, let's go to beryllium hydride. There we go. Keep it simple. And beryllium hydride, we're going to have beryllium in the center. We're going to have two sp hybridized orbitals. They look more or less like this, which means on one side there's going to be a big area and on the other side there's going to be a little area. That is one of the sp hybridized orbitals. The other one is shown in green. That's the other sp hybridized orbital, so one sp hybrid orbital one sp hybridized orbital all right and okay so those are just two orbitals on beryllium these two orbitals are looking like these two drawn here now let's put in the hydrogens. Hydrogen, it's going to have 1s1. That means it's going to be bonding with its 1s orbital. Oh, sorry. Each of these uh, sp hybridized orbitals has one electron in them. One electron in them right here. Now here comes hydrogen with its 1s orbital for hydrogen. It's got a second electron in there. And the bond is, so this is uh, hydrogen and its 1s orbital. The bond is formed by the overlap of the sp hybridized orbital for beryllium and the 1s orbital from hydrogen. The bond is formed by the overlap of the sp hybridized orbital for beryllium for beryllium and the 1s orbital for hydrogen.
no hybridization necessary for hydrogen. It is not a central atom. So that was a lot to take in, I know, but we're gonna do it, good news, we're gonna do it several more times. But uh, our two theories, Vesper theory says that these two uh, electron groups will be as far apart as possible, which for two electron groups is 180 degrees. Valence bond theory says that one orbital from each of the atoms overlaps to form the bond. Those orbitals each had one electron, so now we know that we have two electrons being shared, still a bond. And beryllium is an sp hybridized, hydrogens is a 1s orbital, and now let me draw the other hydrogen. with its 1s orbital as well. And so this is what's called an orbital overlap diagram. Because it literally shows the overlap of the orbitals from each of the atoms. Now we have one more thing to do, which is the definition of a sigma bond. A sigma bond is a bond in which the electron uh, density lies between the two nuclei. And what do I mean by that? See how these two orbitals lie between the two nuclei and the electrons and the orbital overlap are between the two nuclei? Well, believe it or not, we will see in future videos electron density above and below. Those will not be sigma bonds. This is a sigma bond. A sigma bond has, is a bond in which the electron density, the shared electrons, lies between the two nuclei. Let's do one more in this video and show you how the process works for three electron groups. For three electron groups uh, around the central atom, the electron geometry will be called trigonal planar. The bond angle will be 120 degrees and the hybridization will be sp2. Three, so two of the p's, and I know it's a little weird because we're used to putting electrons up here, but these are two p hybridized orbitals, also hybridized with the s. These three go together always, and uh, we'll do some drawings and things like that too. Uh, boron, an exception to the octet rule. You don't have to memorize it, but it is nice and handy for this case. There are, uh, let me do the Lewis structure with all its pairs of electrons. There we go. Boron, I know it's weird. It doesn't have an octet, but that's okay for this case. Now let's go through the boron atom and hybridized boron atom on the periodic table. It's element number five. It has five electrons and it ends in the 2p area. 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. It's orbital energy diagram. which shows increasing energy for the orbitals as 1s2, up and down arrow, 2s2, up and down arrow, and just one arrow in 2p, because there's only one electron in 2p. Now, again, so we do have three electron groups. We'll talk about and we'll draw the trigonal planar geometry in a minute, but this is sp2 hybridization. And for sp2 hybridization, we are going to circle three orbitals. 
and three electrons. Has to be an sp2 as well. There are three orbitals and three electrons. For the hybridized atom, all right, 1s, exactly the same place, exactly the same electrons. Two, uh, sp2 hybridized electrons are going to be at the average of these three, so somewhere over here. And the other two, oh, let's see, sp2. And the other p, I don't care. It just has to be clearly someplace higher. There could be some overlap. There doesn't have to be. Now our sp2 hybridized orbitals, three orbitals, three electrons. These are bonding orbitals. These electrons, so boron, each of these hybridized orbitals has one electron from boron. The fluorines will each bring one electron to form those bonds we just did in the previous example. 2p, this 2p, still empty. All right. Now, the visualization as you go to uh, more and more uh, complicated hybridizations is not easy. I wouldn't worry about it. What we need to know is that if you take these three orbitals, an S and two of the P's, and you hybridize them, you can mathematically show that these three orbitals at 120 degree angles to each other and pictured here are equivalent to the three orbitals here. And in fact, we're gonna start just drawing the nucleus where we'll put a boron and these parts. We won't worry about these other, other sized uh, or other phased portions of the orbital. So when I draw the shape of boron trifluoride, I would put boron. Uh, I will try and approximate 120 degree angles. And it is a planar molecule, hence the name trigonal planar. Trigonal because it looks like a triangle, planar because it is a flat molecule. It is in the plane. So this is the shape. When you draw the shape for me, you don't have to include all the electrons. Lewis structures include all electrons, all bonds, all atoms. Shapes show me approximately the angles that I'm talking about. Now, uh, now let's draw an orbital overlap diagram. For BF3, put boron in the middle. Each of these is an sp2 hybridized orbital. Fluorine, fluorine, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. It's going to have one of its 2p orbitals, one electron for fluorine, one electron for boron. And I'm going to try and squinch these in over here in green. P. And so if the question were which orbitals are overlapping, for boron and fluorine in uh, BF3, you would suggest that it is an sp2 hybridized orbital from boron and a 2p unhybridized orbital, which still has two parts, regular old 2p orbital, could be 2px, 2py, or 2pz. And uh, that would be the orbitals that are overlapping.